Girls. The instant my mother saw my face, she gasped. It flashed through her mind that I had suddenly contracted measles or scarlet fever or some such red and rashy affliction. She pulled me farther into the light of the living room. It wasn't a disease. It was lipstick, red, lippy patches of it all over my face. I had just come from a birthday party at Nana Norris's. I explained that we had played some sort of game, the exact nature of which I don't recall. That resulted in all the girls mobbing one boy and smooching him dead with their red, oh-so-grown-up, lipsticky lips. My mother told me to go upstairs and wash it off. She remembers almost wishing it had been measles. I was seven years old, and I already had a girlfriend. Judy Brooks. Judy Brooks, Brooks lived in a yellow brick front porch twin house half a block up the street at 718 George. She wore her brown hair and pigtails. She could tie a dress bow behind her back. She jumped rope double dutch. She could scream high enough to make dogs howl. She played jacks and hand clap games. She whispered and giggled a lot. We began our relationship in first grade after I entered Harfton Elementary partway through the year. I don't remember how I determined that she was my girlfriend, only that I thought of her that way, and that if someone said to me as adults, as adults do, do you have a girlfriend? I would say, yes, and the adult would say, who? And I would say, Judy Brooks. There wasn't much more to it than that. As a romance, it could be better described by what did not happen as by what did. We did not hold hands, we did not kiss, we did not walk to school together, we did not even talk much to each other. I did, however, accompany her parents to a dance recital that she participated in. And one Saturday morning, I went with her to her dentist, Dr. Wenoff, on Marshall Street. I remained behind in the waiting room while she bravely followed the nurse out of sight. Minutes later, I heard her scream. I tensed. I fretted. Was she screaming for me? What were they doing to her? Was it the needle? Should I charge in and rescue her? I stewed for another minute or two, then returned to my comic book. When I say we did not kiss, I mean there was no we kissing. Never did she kiss me while I, at the same time, kissed her back but once I kissed her, whether I wanted to or not. One day when we were 10, Judy Brooks and I were on the other side of the tracks near the creek. I was showing her the best kind of rocks to find salamanders under when Eddie Carcary showed up. This was not good news. Eddie Carcary and I had been having our problems. They had begun about a year before when I decided to organize a gang and invited Eddie to join. Eddie was one tough hombre and I figured he would give the gang some muscle. He joined, but then refused to abide by the gang's only rule, to call me captain. So I kicked him out. He retaliated by marching into our backyard in broad daylight and knocking over my mother's basket of clothespins. And now Eddie Carkery was coming toward Judy and me with mischief in his eyes. Pick her up, he said. Huh? I said. Pick her up, pick her up. His red hair and freckles flared with menace. Judy was terrified. I imagined I looked terrified to Eddie as well, but in fact, I wasn't. I'd never picked up a girl before. I'd never even thought about picking up a girl. But now that I was being ordered to do so, it didn't seem like such a bad idea. In fact, considering that the girl to be picked up was Judy Brooks, it, did, it seemed like a darn good idea. I had seen plenty of pickups on television and in the movies, mostly cowboys, hoisting ladies in long dresses who had fainted or sprained their ankles mostly cowboys hoisting ladies in long dresses, who had fainted or sprained their ankle, so I figured I knew the basic move. Okay, I said, trying to sound scared. While Judy stood rigid at a tree trunk, I positioned myself behind her and went through my pre-pickup sequence, spread and plant the feet, crouch, right arm behind her knee, left arm across her back, and lift. In the movies, the lady always came up smartly from the ground, as if she were on a swing, as if she were light as a balloon. It didn't go quite that way for me. When I lifted Judy, when I lifted, Judy's feet came up all right, as high as my shoulder, but the rest of her went down. Her head was around my knees. And now she was sliding towards the ground, her hand groping for my belt. I quickly dropped to one knee and propped her back against the other. Eddie Carkery sneered, You're weak as an ant. Maybe so, but I wasn't through yet. Driven not by Eddie Carkery's sneer, but by visions of Lash LaRue and Tex Ritter, and how they would have done it, I pulled Judy into my butter pickled biceps. I squatted like a weightlifter. I took a deep breath. I heaved and grunted, and I picked her up. It wasn't a classic. Her head and knees were high, while her rear end sagged in the middle, giving her a V-shape. 
My arms turned to stone, my knees buckled under me, but I thought hard of Lash and Tex, and I held it for a good five seconds before I let her down. Now kiss her, Eddie said. Good thing, that's what he said, because the only part of my body not in muscular shock was my lips. I gave her a quick peck on the cheek, and that, to my recollection, was the first time I ever kissed a girl. Eddie Carkery trotted off, no doubt pleased with himself for forcing me to perform two distasteful acts. That was the year Judy Brooks broke up with me. Well, strictly speaking, she didn't break up with me. She broke up with everyone. She announced that she was through with boys. She hated them all. You all, I believe is how she put it. I tried to find a loophole, but no matter how I looked at it, I was a boy. I was one of you all. For the first time since first grade, I was single. With a grim, gritting vengeance, I decided to retaliate by hating all girls, which I did successfully for three or four weeks. Or was it three or four minutes? In any case, by sixth grade, I had another girlfriend, Bobby Garber. Like Judy Brooks, Bobby Garber lived in the 700 block of George Street. She was one of the th three beautiful sisters, probably the most famous female threesome in town. The oldest sister, Randy, was Miss Montgomery County. Ruby was a cheerleader at Stewart Junior High, and the youngest, Roberta, called Bobby, was in fifth grade, a year behind me at Harfton. The Garber girl's father, Bill, was a car salesman on Markley Street, by the brewery. When I was in eighth grade, he sold us our first car, a turtle green 1952 Pontiac. Bobby was a spitfire tomboy. We rode bikes around the West End. We played in the street. And each school day at noon, when class was let out for lunch, Bobby waited with me at an alley that fed onto Chain Street, half a block from school next to Susan Davis's father's fish market. I was a lieutenant in the safety patrol, and it was my duty to stand at the alley and ensure that the kids going home for lunch crossed it safely. I wore a white, military-looking strap that circled my waist and looped diagonally across one shoulder. Pinned to it was my badge, fancy silvered tin with an oval insert painted bright red. I guess I'll never know which dazzled Bobby more, me or the badge. I never gave Bobby Garber a kiss, but I did give her something much more serious, a meaningful as meaningful as a token of my affection as I could manage, and, frankly, a fairly painful sacrifice. I gave her my yo-yo. I have since wondered if I truly gave it as a token of affection, or was I finally getting rid of those infernal knots? Whatever. The romance dissolved when I went off to junior high. I never got my yo-yo back. In seventh grade, I moved on to the next level of kissing, lip to lip, or to be precise, teeth to teeth. Until then, I had never kissed a female, not even my mother, on the lips, unless you count a few times when our dog Lucky surprised me with a wet one. The innocent era came to a close on a spring evening in my thirteenth year. I was riding my bike after dinner. There were several hours of daylight left. I was cruising Hawes Avenue. I had just made my daily pass of Dovey Withmoth's with with house and had crossed Oak into the next block of Hawes when I saw several classmates on the f sidewalk in front of Kathy Heller's house. They called. I stopped. Someone said, Want to play? What? I said. Truth or consequences? Okay, I said. Kathy was there, and Judy Pearson, and Kenny Hengen, and another girl. Apparently, they were short on boys. However, the truth part of the game went. However, the truth part of the game went. The consequence was always the same. You had to kiss a girl. I saw Kenny Hengen do it, and thought, uh oh. He really got into it. Lip to lip, arm around the girl, eyes closed. The smooch seemed to go on for hours, right there on the sidewalk. Broad daylight. I had stumbled into the big time. Was I ready for it? Why hadn't I just waved and kept on pedaling? I wished I were still a cowboy. Nearby waited my roadmaster like a patient, faithful horse. And then it was my turn. And there was blonde-haired Kathy Heller, to whom I hardly ever spoke, with whom I had absolutely nothing in common, standing in front of me, taking off her glasses, awaiting her consequence. Had I time to practice, I might have rehearsed with a pillow or teddy bear. As it was, my lip-eye coordination was a trifle off. I did not so much kiss her as smash my face into hers. Our teeth met with an audible clack. But I stayed with it, and so did she. We disengaged teeth and backed off to lip death depth and resumed blotting at each other. I forgot to close my eyes, however, and to this day I have never had a better view of two eyebrows. When it seemed a respectable amount of time had elapsed, we stopped. The kiss itself could not have lasted more than three or four seconds, but in my ruminations later, it went on for weeks. I soon began to imagine that I had been as bold, smooth, and masterful as Kenny Hengen. Once or twice I heard my roadmaster whinny. But it was only in my dreams. This ends the chapter. Please answer your questions by going back into the text before moving on to the next chapter.